the Word of God, and then you look at modern Christianity. Do you see a discrepancy? Some of us don't want to see the discrepancy. We want to tell ourselves, no, it's similar. It's a similar vibe between the book of Acts and what we have now. We come up with elaborate doctrinal excuses for why we're impotent as a church. Why our prayers seem to hit a tin roof. The word of God is timeless and it's eternal. It defines what Christianity is meant to be. Our God is not ultimate. Our God is not evolving. He does not change. He does not lie. There is no shadow of turning in him. He is rock-like. Our God has not moved. It's us that have moved. We have moved and we've lost sight of the rock. You build upon anything else, it will fail you when the winds and the rains come and beat against your house. The Irish elk. The Irish elk is officially classified as extinct. It's sort of hard to give an accurate understanding of how big this animal is. At the top of its brow, it's about 10 feet tall. On top of its 10 foot tall head, it had a rack of antlers that spanned 12 feet in width. 12 feet! That's bigger than Goliath, just on top of his head. Yet it went up five more feet. 15 feet of massiveness. What I'm looking at here is something that I would liken to true Christianity. Christianity the way God intended it to be. We love seeing elk. Elk are majestic creatures. They stir us for some reason. There's something about an elk that is moving. They're a regal animal. However, what's the height of an elk, would you guess? I mean, would we say five, six feet would be the top of a head, maybe? And those are still big, right? Rack of antlers, maybe a couple feet above that. We might get up to eight feet. You take a modern-day elk and stand it next to an Irish elk. You were really impressed with the modern-day version, weren't you? Our problem is we've lost sight of the Irish elk version of Christianity. We don't even believe it exists. We honestly believe it's gone extinct. We don't go after it. God doesn't intend to do those things in a man or a woman of God anymore. That was what he did back then. Those are things for yesteryear, not for today. You see, we need a rack of antlers, something that causes the world to stop their car, slam into a pole and say, did you see that? When I was studying extinct animals, this is what it said. Despite being officially classified as extinct, sightings are still reported. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if sightings are still being reported, shouldn't you remove or change the classification of extinct? Doesn't extinct to you mean God? No more! You see, this is Christianity. And this is what God wants to bring back. You see, what we say is, despite being officially classified as extinct, true Christianity, brawny Christianity, the type of Christianity that stands on a rock and is unmoved in a generation, the type of Christianity that knows the power of their God, George Mueller's their way through to support a thousand orphans, to grow them up merely on faith, it's extraordinary pictures that have been exemplified through our Christianity, C.T. Studd going at the age of 52 and dying body, goes into the heart of Africa, untamed Africa, where cannibals live, lives there 20 years and turns Africa on its head. Who are these men? They were Irish elk. Let's behold majesty again, fall flat on our face, recognize our uncleanness and the uncleanness of the system around us, and allow our God to clothe us in his blood. Allow our God to cleanse us with his blood. Allow our God to regenerate us, to set our feet upon a rock, to make us tributes to his glory. They may not believe that the stature of a true man or a woman of God can grow 10 feet at the brow. They may not believe that the lack of glory that we are to carry as Christians spans 12 feet in width and another four or five feet above our heads. They may not believe it, but we believe. Awake, awake. Put on strength, the arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, as in the generations previous to us. We know who you are, God. We believe. We have not forsaken you. We know that you do not slumber. We know you are waiting for a generation to rise up with faith. 
I can't remember if it was George Mueller or one, one of them guys, that 52 years old, on his deathbed, answered a call to go to Africa and went and turned Africa upside down. That's what happens when somebody relinquishes their whole being to God. I watched the movie the other day, and it, it, it kind of, it, I, I enjoyed the movie, but it was just, there was some things about it that just disturbed me. The Shack. Anybody seen The Shack? Well, it, I cried. It was moving. It was a moving story about a man that daughter got abducted by a, a killer, and he killed his daughter. And it's a story of redemption, how he learned to forgive. But there were some things in the thing. They, they had a woman that was supposed to be God. They had a woman supposed to be God. The, the, the Holy Spirit was exemplified as a Chinese girl. The God the Son was a, another a, a man. And it was just, it really disturbed me in that we've taken the glory of God and kind of diminished it. We've diminished it. And I'm telling you, when you take the glory of God and you diminish it, then what we lose is the world. Amen. Can you say amen? See, what we are, we are the expression of the glory of God. And we've taken the glory of God and diminished it. Now, that's exactly what happened in Romans chapter 1. And it says in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's kind of like we've, you've uh, uh, abducted the truth and you're, you're keeping it from expressing itself. It's like you kidnapped the truth. You know, the, the, the Bible says this. It says, the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Can you say amen? amen? We've got so many people in church living in sin. Come on, you can amen. say amen. amen. And we hide sin. You know what? The church is the, the easiest place to hide in sin. When I go to Panama, we cast out more devils and people in church than we do in the, in the jailhouse. You know why? This is what the Lord showed me. They, are, they cry to be delivered, but they're so worried about being religious that they don't get delivered. Can you say amen? amen. When we hide sin, see, we need to un get that stuff out. I went back there in that back room right there and I cried out everything I had in me, God. Everything, every desire, every motive in my heart. I didn't even want to do it in the light. Because some of it I felt ashamed. Can you say amen? You know, God in the book of Acts judged hidden sin with Ananias and Sapphira. That was a judgment on hidden sin. And I'm telling you, if we've got hidden sin in our heart, we need to say, God, here it is. God, I ain't what I need to be. I've got a lot of selfishness. I've got a lot of pride. I've got a lot of whatever. God, take it out of me. Deliver me, Lord. And I'm telling you, when we as a church, when we as the people of God begin to come clean, then we can cry out for the world. Can you say amen? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation 
of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godheads, so that they are without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And this is, this is what the, I believe the book, that movie did. They changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into the likeness of corruptible man. God's not a woman. That's right. Can you say amen? amen. He's almighty God. And what we've done, we've minimized and made God into the, something that we can feel comfortable with. You know what, John, John on the Isle of Patmos, this guy used to come up and hug Jesus and, and lay in his bosom and Jesus would tell him stories about glory. I, I don't know what, what exactly was going on. But on the Isle of Patmos, when he saw Jesus in his glory, it says he fell at his feet like a dead man. He saw the glory of God. He didn't run up and say, hey, Jesus, give me a big hug. And I'm telling you, that's what we've lost sight of in this generation. We've lost sight of the glory of God. And we've made God somebody we just hang out with. Oh, here I am, Lord, I'm going to hang out. And we've lost our, our majesty toward him. And we've lost the fear of the Lord in our lives. We live in sin and come to church and praise the Lord, hallelujah, and feel comfortable in it. And we wonder why the glory of God is not being manifested in our churches. Because we've lost sight of the glory of God. In his majesty. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things have become new. It says don't even look at Christ after the flesh anymore. Right. He's not a baby in a manger. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? He's not a little baby in a manger. And we say oh look at Jesus. He's a baby in the manger. He's not a baby anymore. He's the King of kings and He's the Lord of lords. And one day every woman and man and child will stand before Him and give glory to Him and say that Jesus is Lord. Amen. They asked Daniel Webster. Anybody know who Daniel Webster is? He's the one that wrote that big old book with all them words in it and, and defined them all. And they asked Daniel Webster, Daniel Webster, you know a lot about a lot of things. What's the one thing in life that concerns you? And you know what Daniel Webster said? He said that I'm going to have to give a personal account of myself before Christ. I don't know if that scares you, but it scares me. That every word that I've said, everything that I've done, every thought that's went through my head is going to be laid out and shown who I am. And that's a scary thought. And I'm telling you, God looks at our hearts and He sees what's in our hearts. And He wants us to quit holding the truth in unrighteousness, but to allow that truth to bring glory to Him. To be that Irish elk. Amen. Hallelujah. On our job. To be that Irish elk in our family. To be that Irish elk wherever we go so that people stay kind of good. What is that? Turn the world upside down. Jesus took 12 men and turned the world upside down. We got churches packed out left and right. We can't even win the city. Come on. Come on, say amen. amen. I'm telling you because we have diminished his glory. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. I want to see his glory. Amen. You know, and I know it's going to take. You know, me getting past myself. I can be satisfied with what, what I've done, whatever. But I ain't. 
We could be satisfied with, you know, having a little church service every Sunday morning, Wednesday night. Come expect to see God do something. Amen. Don't come waiting and see if God's going to do something. Come expecting him to do something. You know, they asked Smith Wigglesworth one time, said, how do you move God? He said, he said uh, no, he said, how do you get God to move? He said, I make him move. Why you do that, brother? I praise you, Jesus. And you praise him till he moves. You get down on your knees and you pray, like the old days said, until you get a breakthrough. We don't even know what that means anymore. <laughs> I remember when they prayed you through. I, wasn't, I was just kind of on the cusp of it. But I remember they, didn't, you, they prayed until you got something. Fell down and said, I'm just, I'm tired of letting them pray for me. Just fall out so you, you know, you get yourself off the hook or whatever. But I'm telling you, man, God wants to come again. Hallelujah. I've been studying the Welsh revival. A man named Evan Roberts. This man moved the nation. He had, a, he had a nation in his hand. I'm going to read you some of the things that happened in this nation when this man got a hold of God. He, he grew up in a, you know, in a family of his mom and daddy were Christian. Had 13 brothers and sisters. But he was hungry for God. This young man would had to go to work in the coal mines when he was 12 years old. Now you think of that. That's before they had child laws and all that stuff. 12 years old. He made 75 cents a day. But you know what he did? He would, he would go to work early and he would stand out in front of the coal mines and he would witness to all the men as they went in. He'd give them a scripture. He'd tell them, you know, something that God had been showing him. And, and then at lunchtime, he would stand outside the coal mine and he would wait for them to come out to see what they thought about it. And, how, and what, you know, what, what, thing, what, what did God show them about the scripture that he had showed him? I mean, 12 years old now. Think about that. It says that he didn't get into dating and all that stuff. My daughter shows me, you know, Instagram, all that junk going on. And got seven-year-old boys telling eight-year-old girls, I'm so in love with you. You don't even know what love is. <laughs> You stupid is what you are. You lust filled. I'm telling you. And they just, uh, just on and on on Instagram about this person in love and, and I'm on love. It ain't love, it's lust. Can you say amen? And that's the generation of children we're raising right now. Amen. Full of lust. Not full of God. And it's because of this thing right here. Amen. That right there. Probably going to send more people to hell than, you know, at and is the biggest devil around. Right. Hallelujah. See, these people didn't have all that crap. They didn't have TVs and all this stuff to occupy their time. You know, they, they, they saw God. We got so many, we got to fight through all TVs and phones and just, I mean, we, we do everything but pray. Evan Roberts, he, he, was, he was hungry for God. He hungry. He was just a, a young man. He didn't get into dating and playing uh, baseball and football. My Lord, if we could go to start a church over at the ballpark, we probably could win a thousand people to Jesus. Because most of the church people's over there. Can you say amen? Back then, they didn't put the high priority on sports. They put it on God, and sports was kind of on the, you know, back line somewhere. And this young man was hungry for the Lord. He prayed, prayed all the time. They even got, they even, uh, his mom and daddy took him to a psychiatrist because they thought he was crazy. 
He'd just be walking down the street and he'd just stop and start talking to God. God, no, 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 whatever, you know, Lord, what's wrong with all these people? Why don't they see you? Why don't they understand you? And they thought he was crazy because he's talking to God. A young man. I wish my son would stop, get off the phone five minutes and talk to God. I'd say, praise the Lord. Can you say amen? I would, that would be a blessing to me. They thought he was crazy. Shoot, that was, that was wonderful to me. Just stop, just, just stop go in the middle of the street, just talk to God like he, like he knows you. Evan Roberts knew God. He moved the hand of God to touch a nation. He was in college, went to college, went to seminary, cemetery school. Cemetery. <laughs> cemetery school. Cemetery school. That's what I call it. Well, he said he, his, he, there was this famous evangelist close by named Seth Joshua. And Seth Joshua, you know, had been having great revivals in the UK and, uh, he wanted to go to the revival. So him and some of his buddies talked to the principal at school, and they said, hey, would it be odd right if we go to Seth Joshua's uh, meeting uh, this morning instead of ha having class? And the guy said, I mean, it was, he was a good guy. He said, hey, you can learn more in three, uh, a day of revival than you can in three months of school. So they went to the revival, and, they, and Seth Joshua was there, and he was preaching. And he said something that so stirred Evan Roberts. He said, bend me low, Lord. Bend me low. And that became like the, 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 the cry of that revival. Bend me low, Lord. And Evan Roberts began to say that. He began to cry out to God. Bend me low, Lord. God, bend me. Break me, Lord. You, break me so I can be used for you, Lord God. And it, while he was praying this... He saw a vision of whales being lifted up off the ground and, and going up in, toward heaven. And then he see the hand reach down out of heaven and put its hand on whales. And he felt like God wanted to use him for revival. That's what, he, that's what he got out of that. That God was giving him whales. So he, wants, he goes back, he quits seminary, cemetery school. And he goes back to his home church and he tells the pastor, hey, uh, I want to do a youth service on uh, tonight after service. And you know what? He had a good pastor that said, okay. You know, most pastors won't even let somebody preach besides them. That's right. Can you say amen? amen. I'm the only one that God talks to. <laughs> So he lets the young man preach on Sunday night and, you know, invites everybody to come. He said Evan Roberts is going to preach. He got something to say. God's giving him a, a message for the church. And he comes in there and he, he begins to speak. Seventeen people come. Most of them was his family. But seventeen of them come. Some of the youth came. And he goes in and he's he says four things. He said, you need to repent of all sin. All secret sins. All the sins that you're hiding. He said, you need to repent of all sin. Second of all, he said, you need to get rid of any habits that don't glorify God. Any habits, smoking cigarettes, chewing tobacco. I remember chewing tobacco. I remember one time I had me a big old dip of Copenhagen, and I was witnessing to this little boy who's about eight years old. And the first thing he did, he pointed me right there, he said, you in sin. And you know what? It made me mad. I got, I got so mad I threw it out because the Lord had already been convicting me. He just used that eight-year-old prophet to make it plain to me. <laughs> Because it didn't give glory to God. <laughs> glory to God. My mouth about rotten out. You go to most Baptist churches and 
You think it's the glory of God, but it's Marlboro smoke out in the front. <laughs> what kind of glory does that give to God? you telling everybody you're free. And then, I mean, it's like smoke, like it's on fire. Then he said, you need to obey the Spirit promptly. See, that's why their Christianity beats our Christianity, because we, we obey whenever we feel like it, even if we obey. He said, you need to obey the Spirit promptly, and it caused revival. You know, it, the next night, they let Evan preach again, and every night it kind of get, it started kind of like a steamroller. You know, every night it would get a little more thicker, and then people began to break, and people began to cry out. He was even he was even being accused of being telepathic because he didn't preach like most. You know, he he didn't take out a sermon and preach an hour of sermon. He would he would just walk down the aisle and he would look at people and say, "The Holy Ghost says blah blah blah," or he would look at somebody and say, "You need to re blah blah blah. Do this. You need to repent of this sin." You need to stop doing this. You need to, you know, God wants to heal you of that. And they thought he was telepathic because he was just moving in the gift of the Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. And it caused people, people began to get hungry. And he, sometimes he wouldn't preach anything. He'd just pray. He'd just start praying and then the Holy Ghost would fall and people would be, somebody would pick up a song and start singing a song. It was just led by the Spirit. I mean, no, if you want to move with God, you've got to throw your program book away. Amen. God don't move in programs. Right. And this is another thing you've got to throw away. That right there. How many times has God been stopped by that right there? Timex. I've got to hurry up. You hear it all the time. got to hurry up. Well, maybe God don't want you to hurry up. Maybe God wants you to stop and stay a while. That's right. Oh, hurry up, brother. I mean, you can feel it when you get by eight, by eight fifteen. You can feel this. You feel the tug. <laughs> you better stop because we're fixing to leave on you, brother. <laughs> hey, I know. That's what they told Jesus when he was uh, after he had healed all the people and he was fixing to feed the multitudes. They said, it's a desert place out here, and the time is past spent. That means it's time to go home. We don't want to feed nobody else. We don't want to take feeding 5,000 folks at no 7 o'clock. I'm telling you, man, I, there's times I wanted to quit. I mean, in Panama, we had to be quit by 10. By 10, if you wasn't done by 10, the pastor's going to get up, and he's going to shut it down. And I'm telling you, we felt the verge of revival coming. Felt, you know, you can feel those waves come in. And, but he was wanting to get it done by 10. Hallelujah. God don't go by your time schedule. God goes by his time schedule. They, a long time ago, man, they had revivals. They was lasting until 4 in the morning. And then they'd get up and go to work. Now that's revival. When you got somebody stayed at 4 o'clock in the morning at a church, that's revival right there, brother. Yeah, that's a miracle instead of revival. That's a miracle. <laughs> Praise God. But that's how it went. Get rid of all habits. Repent of all sin. Obey the Spirit promptly. Those were his mandates. That's what he said God told him. And people responded to that message. It's a simple message. Repent of your sin. Amen? Now, see, I'm already looking at my watch. I'm talking about the watch and I'm looking at it. That's why we're so conditioned to look at our watch. Hallelujah. Listen to what, what happened at, in this revival. They used to 
use these little horses to bring the coal up out of the coal mines. They had all the coal miners got saved. And then all these horses knew how to respond to was cussing. Oh, yeah. And cuss them horses out and tell them, get on and beat them with sticks and everything. Now the horses didn't know what to do anymore because they wasn't getting cussed out. <laughs> the coal company had to buy new horses and train them. Now you tell me revival is if it's a revival only happens in this place, then it ain't revival. It's just refreshing. It's just a, a move of spirit, a little bit, you know, a dab of do you. But when revival comes, it'll change the city. They had prostitute houses where men from the UK would come over to the prostitute house. All the prostitutes got saved. Now they're coming over to the prostitute houses and what they would do, they would take the men into the room and they would sing songs of glory to them. <laughs> All the prostitutes were saved and they singing songs to them and telling them about revival and asking them to come to church. Now what a slap in the face. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean that's what revival did. It, the prostitutes got saved and became evangelists. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> the Bible Society had so many people wanting Bibles that it took them two years after the revival had stopped to meet the demand. That many Bibles, people wanted the Bible. The, the time schedule on jobs and the businesses, they cut, up, they cut their time short. They started quitting at three instead of six because everybody was wanting to go to the revival. Just think about that Waffle House shut down because people want to go to the revival. There ain't nobody coming to the Waffle House. They're all at church. They're eating the bread of the Lord. Hallelujah. So the whole society was changed by this revival. A hundred thousand, God told Evan Roberts, when he gave him that vision, he said, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand souls in three months. He turned to his friend and he said, you believe God can give me a hundred thousand souls? And he said, yeah, why not? <laughs> How many know you take the limits off God, he might can do something. That's right. Instead of going, err, God, no, err. Hallelujah. The banks, now check this out, people started paying their loans. <laughs> the banks, revenue went up during this revival because people that had, had taken loans out and wasn't paying them got convicted and went and started paying their loans. That's what I told my wife. I said, you are just, when your people come in and can't pay their loans, just start singing to them songs of revival. <laughs> Maybe they'll pay their bills. The police station had to lay off over half of their policemen because the cr the crime there was no crime. Everybody was in church. Hallelujah. Think about that. Our pre our policemen have to work overtime. And see, we're trying to legislate laws to create morality in our society. It'll never happen. What we need is a move of the Holy Ghost. What we need is for God to step down in the city of Cartersville, in the, in the city of Atlanta, and visit. No, not visit, abide. Stay a while. Hang out. they became coffee shops because nobody would drink anymore. So they had to do something else to, you know, to accommodate the people coming. They just opened up coffee shops. And everybody came and read their Bible and, and prayed and, and sought God. 
I'm telling you, when true revival comes, and see what we call revival, we put a man's name up out there in the front and say, three days we're going to have preaching, we call that revival. That ain't revival. <laughs> Revival's when prostitutes get saved. Revival's when bars close down. Revival's when banks get, you know, have their bills paid. Amen. That's revival. Glory to God. When our horses won't move unless we praise the Lord. <laughs> that's revival. Glory to God. Oh, the World Cup was going on at the time of the revival. You know what the World Cup is? Soccer, football. Everybody loves football over in Wales and England. They love that stuff. They closed the World Cup down wow. during revival. On the books that talk about the World Cup at that time, all it says beside it is revival. <laughs> I mean, just think, the Super Bowl. If the Super Bowl, two teams come out and the Falcons ain't got nobody to let down. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, when, when God begins to move in a nation, in a people, in a church, and people get hungry for him, all the other stuff that we've put our pursuits in will fall to the wayside. I believe it. I'm going to cry until I see something. I might not see the depth of it like this, but I believe God wants to do something. I didn't just pray for revival a year ago when I started preaching here. I was praying for it in Atlanta. I've been praying for it all my life. I want to see a move of the Spirit of God. I've seen glimpses of it. I've seen little bits of it. I've seen it in the kids sometimes. I've had God come down in certain places. I felt like the glory was there, but it just it never lasted. It was only just like temporary. And I believe God's going to do it. Amen. And I want to be like Smith Wiggles where I'm going to make him do it. I'm going to cry until he got to do it. Amen. You know, we went to Argentina. We had church on Sunday morning. They don't have church on Sunday morning in Argentina. They play soccer on Sunday morning. And they have church. See, they, they accommodate church around their idol soccer. And a lot of times that's how we do. We accommodate God around all our idols. Uh-oh, I'm meddling now. And I'm telling you, we need to put our idols down, our Dagons down, and lift up the name of Jesus again, and, uh, and uh, put our life around Him. Amen. We preached on Sunday morning. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost fell in that place. They wasn't about 20 people because everybody's at soccer. They was packed out in all the other services, but on Sunday morning, you'd think everybody would come on Sunday morning. But I'm telling you, God showed out in those few that came. And about every one of them in there got filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, now look, Amen. I'm not saying this to try to make anybody feel bad or feel shame or condemnation. I'm just trying to stir you up to see that what we got now ain't all there is. It ain't all there is. There's a whole lot more. And we need to take the limits off God, the limits off what he wants to do, and we need to say, Lord, do what you want to do. Amen. Do what you want to do. I take your limits off in my own life. Strip me down. Make, do what you want to do in me, Lord. Obey the Spirit promptly. That right there, that gets about all of us right there. Can you say amen? amen? But we want him to move promptly when we call on him, don't amen. we? Can you say amen? amen? And I'm telling you, when we begin to move promptly when he calls on us, then he'll begin to move promptly when we call on him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I had a wood pulpit, I'd hit it, but I ain't got one. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. I'm tired of a little dab of duty. 
What we get in American churches is about a, just enough to make us want a little more. And sometimes we don't get that. Sometimes we go home unsatisfied, wondering what just happened. We got sinners that come to church looking for God, and when they get here, they can't find Him. What an indictment on us as a people of God. When they come here, I mean, you don't know if they're ever going to come back again. They say Gandhi went to some American churches looking for God and couldn't find Him, so he went over to, to India and started his own religion. Because he couldn't find God in American churches. Ain't that something? And I'm telling you, we got kids that are that are drinking from the, the, the stuff of this world because they can't find a drink in the house of the Lord. Amen. There's not enough of moving of the Spirit of God to convict them of their sin. You got people that will sit in church living in fornication, shacking up, and, and won't even move because they ain't enough of the Spirit of God to convict them out of it. Brother, they don't nobody do that at our church, do they? Yeah, they do. They sure do. They sure do. And we need to have enough of the Spirit of the Lord, even in our own lives, that would convict people. Does, does our life convict somebody of their sin? Do we live close enough to God that when somebody looks at us, it convicts them of their not being close to God? Are we just flowing with everybody else? We laugh at the cussing whenever somebody tells a dirty joke. We just we just laugh right in it. We just flow with the river. Can you save me? We need to cry out to him. Do it in us first, Lord. Do it in me, Lord. I'm not looking at anybody else but me. I'm not praying for you to do it in him or her or anybody else. Do it in me first. Amen. And I'm telling you, if we'll do that, we'll say, God, do it in me. Do something in me. Change me, God. Change my passions. Change my passions. What I desire. You know, a lot of times you can look in somebody's refrigerator or what they got on TV to see where their passions are. Can you say me? Look in their refrigerator or look at their TV or their phone. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Cry up for revival. Take a burden. God's calling you to pray. You might be the only one that can reach those that are in your life. We say, brother, would you pray for my, my family? There, Somebody ain't saved. You pray for them. The pain is closer to you than it is anybody else. Can you say amen? I can ask you to pray for my kids, but I got to pray for my kids. My kids are my responsibility. My kids are my responsibility to get them into heaven. I can go to the Dominican Republic, Argentina, and anywhere else and miss my own family. I missed it. Can you say amen? Pray for this church. Pray for this church to be, be what God wants it to be. What God wants it to be. Not what the deacon board, not what Duran, not by anybody else in the church, what God wants it to be. Amen. Pray for God to use Duran Amen. to shake him up, stir him up, set him on fire. That he comes here on Sunday morning and just watch him burn. <laughs> Can you say amen? amen? Spend more time in prayer. Don't let, you know, 15 minutes before service on Wednesday night be the only time you pray. Can you 
you say amen? amen. It's like riding a bicycle. I don't know how to pray. We'll get on the bicycle and start praying, and you'll learn how to pray. Amen. Really, passion is all you need to pray. Can you say amen? Passion, that's it. If you've got passion, you just open your mouth and pray. Look at somebody that's going to hell that you know and say, God, I'm going to be the intercessor to keep them out of hell. Maybe they ain't got nobody. Maybe they don't have a mama that prays. Maybe they don't have a daddy that prays. Maybe they don't have a church that's interceding for them. Maybe they might be the only person they know that knows God. Didn't you say amen? amen? You take it on you. Well, I'm, I'll, you know, somebody else. I'll call TBN and let them pray. You pray. This is your city. Does, it, does everybody live in Cartersville here? This is your city. I don't like seeing Cartersville on the 11 o'clock news. Amen? amen? I don't like seeing Cartersville babies falling in pools and drowning because mama's out doing whatever. Can you say amen? amen. We're, we're the intercessors for Cartersville. We're the ones that keep the devil off of Cartersville. Or we just sit around and we don't do anything. God's looking for an intercessor. He's looking for somebody that will stand in the gap. Oh, we're better than the church down the street. That ain't who we compare ourselves to. They did too. Can you say amen? When we look at the book of Acts, are we... Do we look like the Irish elk? Do people ride by our church and go, look how many cars is in that parking lot? Let me go see what's going on up in there. <laughs> you know, they come by on Wednesday night and don't hardly see nobody here. I mean, when you see a bunch of cars, I drive home and there's a little church over there on Casper Road. Uh, Freedom Worship Center is packed out on Wednesday night. I just want to stop going there with them. It's packed out every Wednesday night. I want this place packed out. We ought to have every chair filled in here with people interceding for the city of Cartersville and for our own families and for God to move in this place. Amen. And he will move if we'll cry. He's waiting for us to cry. He wants to pour the Holy Ghost out. He died so the Spirit of God could be poured out. Amen. It ain't like God's up there trying to hold it from us. He's just waiting for us to say, give it to me, Lord. We want it. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. I'm tired of seeing, going to other countries and seeing people baptized in the Spirit. And not seeing anybody here. People getting saved. And you know, I'm telling you, the reason they, they get it and we don't is because they ain't comfortable like we are. Can you say amen? Most of us go home, including myself, sit down in front of the TV, flip it on. We're comfortable. When you're on your way to church, cry out for God to do something. Spend the time that you have crying out. Don't come in here and get, get prayed up. Come in here prayed up. Yep. Amen. You know, most time we spend most of the service trying to get people up to a point that they can even receive anything from God. Can you say amen? amen. First of all, they've got to work through all the problems and all the stuff going on in their head and oh my God, oh. And then finally at the end of service, they're about ready to receive, but it's, it's over with. Praise the Lord. Father, I thank you. Let's cry out for revival. We've been praying for revival. I want to cry out for about five minutes for revival. God, we just ask you, Father God, to send revival to this place, Father God. Send revival into our own hearts, God. 
you said that you wished that we were either hot or cold. You said if we're lukewarm, you'd spew us out of your mouth. Father God, how can, a, how can the, the very God of heaven live inside of us and we not be on fire? God, send it all to this place. Start it in us, Lord God. Start it in this group right here, Lord God. Lord, we right now confess our sin before you. We confess our complacency. We, we, we confess our lack of interest in your kingdom, God. We confess, Father God, not having a burden for humanity, Father God. We ask you to forgive us, Lord. You, Father God, when you died and saved us, God, you didn't pull us off, off the earth, God. You left us here for a purpose, Father God, a purpose to be an intercessor in the earth. And, God, we ask you to help us, God. Give us a burden for it, Father God. Wake us up in the middle of the night, Father God. With people in our heart, Father God. With people in our minds, God. Let us, Father God, people run into people at work or wherever, God. And put, a, put a, in a heart a concern for them, Father God. Hallelujah. God, we're crying out for revival. We're crying out for you to move mightily in this place, Father God. We're crying out, Father God, that you to set every person that teaches on fire, every person that preaches on fire. Father God, every, every person that makes decisions on this, about this church, set them on fire, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Let mediocrity, Father God, be a byword in our life. Let us be on fire for you, Father God. Let, set us on fire like Martin Luther said and, watch, and let people watch us burn, Lord. In the name of Jesus, God, we pray for every human being, every man, woman, and child in the city of Cartersville. We ask you, Father God, to save them. We ask you, Father God, to bring a move to this church, Father God, that when they come here, Father God, they don't leave empty, Father God, but they find exactly what they need. If they need deliverance, they get delivered. If they need healing, they get healed, Father God. Bring the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. That we don't have to preach people into the kingdom. The Holy Ghost just comes down in here and He convicts people into the kingdom. Convict us of our righteousness, Father God. Places, Father God, where we're lacking, Father God. Places, Father God, of compromise in our life, God. Places, Father God, that, Father God, we've let go, Father God. Convict us, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Start in our home, God. Start in our family, Father God. Start in our homes, Father God. In the name of Jesus. Let the ark of God set down in our house like it did in Obed-Edom's house, God, and we welcome it in. We cater to your presence, Father God. We cater to your, Father God, what you want. We don't surround our lifestyle around Father God, you or baseball or anything else, God, football, soccer or anything else, God, movies, whatever it is, God. But we put our life and we centralize our life around you and around church, Father God. Lord, they used to put churches right in the middle of the city so that the whole city, Father God, based whatever was going on around the steeple and around the church, Father God. Let it be that way again, God. Let it be that way again, Father God, that people, Father God, don't, Father God, put their Christianity around what time Shoney's opens up. Hallelujah. If you want to move, God, move. You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. Come on, say that to him right now. You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place. We want you here. We can't live without you. We can't do without you. Come, Lord. The Spirit of the bride say, come. Let the Spirit be here, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. We thank you for our Father. Hallelujah. Shalom abotoniyas. Tandaribo soriandaribo shatayas. Right now, cry out for God to forgive you of your sin. God, we ask you to forgive us for it. We ask you, Father God, to have mercy on our hearts, God. God, sins that we, Father God, hid, Father God, areas of our life where we compromise, Father God. 
our mouth, Father God, that gets out of whack sometimes, our thoughts, Father God, that run astray, our heart that meditates on things it shouldn't meditate on, our ears that hear things they shouldn't hear, our eyes that behold things, Father God, they shouldn't behold, God. Get a hold of us, Father God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah. How can we call this world to repent, Father God, and we live in our own sin? Take these hidden sins, God, these hidden passions, these hidden desires, Lord. Sanctify them, Father God. Fill us with the Spirit of God. Fill us with the Spirit of truth. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. We ask you to forgive us for not obeying you promptly, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. Hallelujah. 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 We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Lord, let this be the lighthouse in the city of Cartersville. Let this church be the lighthouse in the city of Cartersville, Lord. Hallelujah. Don't let people ride by here and look at this place and say, ugh, bunch of hypocrites. Let them ride by this place and say, I'm going to go there because I feel God's in that place. Shea Motaye. Kaye Mohondaye say, Use us, God. Here we are, Lord. Send us. Use us, Father God. Hallelujah. Use us to win this city, Father God. Use us, Father God. In the name of Jesus, put the anointing on us, God, to win those where we work in, God. Put the anointing on us, Father God, to win our own families, Lord. Hallelujah. Those that have been hurt by Christian folks, Father God. Those that have been hurt by folks that said they're Christian but didn't have it as real in their life. Put that rack of antlers on us, God. Let us be that Irish elk in this community, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we ain't going to quit crying until we see souls every day, every week, Father God, saved at this altar. We thank you for the young man that come up Sunday, Father God, and, and I don't know whether he got saved or whatever, but we thank you, Father God, that he came up. And we're asking you to fill these altars, Father God. In the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. God, you're the same God that saved Wales. You're the same God that saved, that saved Lewis, Lord. You used me and like Evan Roberts, but he wasn't the only one, Lord. And God, I know that you can use me and again. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah.